have the pride, the privilege, nay, the pleasure of introducing to you a knight fired by night. I am not your missing rib, sir. Well, if you were, then my ribs are made of gold. When I met Heath, he had a presence that was very understated. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. That's very different from a lot of these younger actors. Tell me your name. Uh, so many young actors seem still very boyish at that age. And he, there's something very kind of self-possessed about him. He's 21 going on 50. You know, it's extraordinary sort of uh, sense he has about himself. It's wonderful. It's quite often that when you're that young, you feel like, yeah, I've got to do a lot. I've got to try and make a, an impression. And that's not really what it's all about. If you can sort of subdue that, it all becomes internalized. And it's a lot more interesting for an audience. Of course. You allow the audience to find you and work out what's going on inside your head. That's what Heath does really well, I think. It's a medium of storytelling, and I love telling stories, and I love to transport people places that they dream of. And you get to live it also yourself. I was from Perth, Western Australia. I was acting from the age of 10 or 12, and then I got cast in a television show called Raw. And that was my ticket to Hollywood, I guess. You know, I put my stakes up a lot higher and tried to get you know, better roles with better filmmakers. Glory and riches, glory and riches, glory and riches! And I just kept pushing through until Patriot came along and swept me up. He was shooting the Patriot when I was casting, so I actually met him at the airport. And I just knew right away that this had to be the guy. It's my first lead movie, really, in the States, and uh, I haven't felt like I've got the weight of the lead character because I have an, uh, an incredible ensemble cast with me. I'm driving the bus, but, you know, we're taking it in turns. Action! I have a passion for it, and, you know, thank God it's an occupation I have which I really love and enjoy, and that's, that's the gift of it. There is a certain grace to having that much pressure put on you at such an early age. It's not like you're fighting for confidence. People are giving it to you. And he deals with it really well and uses it in a really grounding way. I'm discovering more about life and about myself. I've had a lot of fun, a lot of great experiences, and things have been opening up for me. You know, I'm really just taking it day by day. There were rules of courtly love as to how a romance had to be conducted. The first of which is love has to be at first sight. You don't even know her name. Her name is Aphrodite, Calypso, Venus. Take your pick. And another rule was that love had to be communicated through a messenger. So Ulrich! My lady bids you wear this token. Well, of course. She also said to tell you her name is Jocelyn. And that's why the Christiana character is always coming back and forth. My lady says this, my lady says that, because that's one of the rules. I'm going to win this tournament for you. Excuse me. The, look, your beauty will be reflected in the power of my arm, the flanks of my horse. Really? It's flanks? He was being the opposite of what she thought he was. He was screwed up what was supposed to be a very romantic and intimate moment. Oh, his horse's flanks. Maybe where he comes from, it means love. Another rule is that you have to go against your own nature to prove your love. Jocelyn, how may I prove my love to you? How? If you improve your love, you should do your worst. My worst? What do you mean? There's a whole thing between Guinevere and Lancelot in which she tells him that he's going to prove his love to her. He has to lose. And so I immediately had to find a way to incorporate it into the story. What are you doing? Losing. I don't understand. Oh, neither do I. It's a good test of love. I, I love that part. I love the fact that she says that to William. There she is, the embodiment of love. Your Venus. You really love me. You're going to go against your nature. You're going to go against your will. How oh, I hate her. He loves me. As much as he hates her, he cannot believe she's doing this to him. Look, I know, I know, I must lose. Is she not watching, huh? She says that if you love her, you will not lose another match. He's like, oh, my God, women. I don't understand women. Nor do I, but they understand us. Maybe not you. Guinevere comes to Lancelot. Let him well, my lady. Let him well. The 
the tournament would go on a tour across Europe and they'd be in one city one week and a couple of weeks later they'd be in another city. It was one of the most popular sports in medieval Europe, somewhere between football and NASCAR. That's me, homeboy! That's me, homeboy! It was a whole side business of people that followed the tour and supported the knights and made lances and fixed bridles and doctors who patched up bruises and different injuries. Indicate in which events shall your Lord Ulrich compete? Jousting was the glamour event. I mean, if it was the Olympics, the joust was the 100 meter dash. But there were also all these other events, which were mostly foot fighting, sword fighting, and fighting with maces, and fighting with the halberds. If there was a weapon, they had an event for it. There was one event called the melee, and it was basically kind of a demolition derby on horseback. They would get knights on each end with swords and blunted instruments and stuff, and just go at each other. Five. Ten blows by sword. So only sword. to the same first. They were hacking swords. Use the weight of the sword to batter the other guy down. When you're in the sword ring, you receive uh, ten blows and then you strike ten blows. <laughs> your first ten, you're blocking. Then it's your turn to, to try and hit the other guys. The speed, dexterity, the sureness of your feet, all those are put to the test. And it's the person with the greatest skill that wins the day.